I think we're gonna get started. My name is Marsha Hines, and I wanted to come here and introduce Dr. Ellis because he is one of the few doctors who I think puts it all together. Now, my son has already recovered. He's an aerospace engineer. And um, the reason he's recovered is because we treated his autism medically, behaviorally, and educationally. And when I heard Dr. Ellis's speech last year, my mouth flew open because I had never seen a doctor who had put all the pieces together and really got it. And then my first question to him after he finished his talk was, so where do you do stand-up when you're not in the office? Because he's hysterical. And he listens to parents, okay? He listens to us, which is a whole new thing. And besides that, he knows that we're the experts on our kids. He gives what we think real value, and I so appreciate that. So you're in for a real treat today with Dr. Ellis. He's the best. What she said is actually true as far as the stand-up line. I said, I'm not that funny. She said, no, you're pretty funny. And then, like the 10 of you or so who managed to crawl out of bed to get in here, by the end of the conversation, there might be 100 people in here, and they said, yeah, you're pretty funny. I don't think I'm that funny. Um, unfortunately, I don't think there's anything funny about autism. I think it's a word that doesn't do anything more than describe a few behaviors. And I think that when I see kids, I'm, I'm a pediatrician by certification and training, and I look at the children as though there's something wrong with them, that there's some illness. If you bring your kid to the doctor and the, your child isn't well, they're supposed to figure out why they're not well, not putting a label on it and saying, he's autistic, have a nice day. So what, what we do know is what we're gonna talk about today. Some of it you've heard before. I think this is a really good kind of summary of all the things you need to be thinking about when it comes to taking care of your children or if you're professional people, how to evaluate your own patients. And I think that if you realize that you have to spend a lot of time doing this, that a really good history and a thorough physical exam is extremely important because then we as physicians don't even know where to start. And the name of the game here isn't like, let's order a million tests and see what we come up with. You have to have some reason for doing what you're doing. So we're gonna talk about neuroinflammation <clears throat> in autism spectrum disorders. In fact, autism basically is an immunological problem very often associated with autoimmune problems creating inflammation in the brain. But what does that mean? We throw these terms around and nobody understands what they mean. So hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll have a better idea. We know that some of the things that can go wrong with any mammal on this planet is there may be a genetic predisposition for things to happen. But most of the things, as you've heard at this conference and, and other places, they're the epigenetic or the things that are really outside of our genetic hardware will influence how our bodies behave. Um, those uh, epigenetic influences that you have to think about are pretty standard across the board. There can be infections in your body that you don't know that you have. There can be environmental triggers, um, seasonal changes, pollen, um, toxins from air pollution to medications to other things that may have been introduced during the pregnancy or thereafter to the baby. Um, food, which seems to be a really big problem. And the fifth categories, usually drugs, but I put that at the end because most of the times the kids are not given a medicine and then all of a sudden they're autistic afterwards. And most of the children hopefully that I see are young enough where they really haven't been on drugs per se, and I'm not speaking of antibiotics, but you know other types of medications. So if we look at the potential triggers, and these are things you have to keep in mind, you have to think about the infections that can be viral, bacterial, fungal, the yeasts, you have to see what the person's immune status is because if your child has an immune deficiency, they won't respond to infections the way a typical person might. Um, the environment throws toxins at us. We suffer from air pollution, noise pollution, water pollution, electromagnetic radiation. It's just not great what's happening on the planet. And in fact, I think what's happening is the children who are on the autism spectrum have actually tried to accommodate to all of these stressors by, in a sense, mutating, they're changing, they're adapting. But during that course of adaptation, a lot of things tend to go wrong. We have to look at um, what is the 
potential neurological function of a child before we assume that there's something wrong with their nervous system. Is it damaged? Is it injured? Is it broken? What's happening? And then we have to also think about the way the body is supposed to respond to these stressors, that we have something called homeostasis, which maintains balance, and that helps us adapt to things. But if we do not have an adaptive response, the maladaptive responses can lead to dysfunction of all of our systems. We have to look at the nervous system, because if there is a maladaption in the nervous system, we can wind up with neurodegeneration. And then we have to see, do we have the ability to manufacture the anti-inflammatory components that will sort of reduce the inflammatory situation that's happening in the brain. I use a lot of silly analogies because most people have no idea what I'm talking about at this point. So think about it's like you've been smelling smoke. Um, the fire department isn't coming because they don't see a fire. But once in a while, a fire flares up, and basically they come, and they put out the fire, but you're still smelling smoke, and nobody listens to you. That's what inflammation is. Okay? We can define it a little bit more specifically. When we talk about neuroinflammation, it is inflammation of the nervous tissue, which can be a response to the various triggers that I discussed, traumatic brain injury, toxic metabolites, or autoimmunity. So one has to ask those questions and figure that out when they're seeing a patient. In the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord, microglia, which are the cells that program cell death, we don't mind killing cells that are not functioning properly. What we don't want to do is kill cells that are functioning properly, and that's an issue. So this is part of what we call our innate immune system, and they can be activated appropriately when they're exposed to various triggers. Usually the nervous system is very um, privileged as far as the immune system goes because there's a lot going on there, and we have this thing called the blood-brain barrier that's supposed to prevent things from below our neck, essentially, what's going on in the body to invade the brain and kind of mess up what I call the control center. Um, <clears throat> and the uh, brain, of course, is ex composed of various types of cells, neurons, and so forth. We have circulating immune cells that can cross a blood-brain barrier, except that if they're not supposed to cross, then you have things going from where they're supposed to be to a place where they're no longer anatomically welcome, and then you have an immune response that in occurs. And the response is actually designed to protect the nervous system from infections, agents. But in fact, when it's not working right, can actually become toxic. So the actual response to a trigger might create more of a problem if the response, the immune system, is not working properly. Um, we used to think that neuroinflammation was defined as a pathological immune process within the nervous, within the nervous system. Um, and the hallmarks of the inflammation are central nervous system injuries, stroke, injury, or infection. If you think about inflammation generically, it's heat, redness, swelling, and pain. Now imagine if you have any of that going on in your brain and you don't speak and you have major pain, headaches, whatever, you can't say, I'm in pain, mommy, please help me, but you act like you're in pain. And in fact, if you have a dog or a cat or you're familiar with any other mammals on this planet, animals get very aggressive when they're in pain. They don't feel good. We have to consider that the newer definition of neuroinflammation is now assumed to be present even only as a hallmark of something going wrong. So by itself, it's not bad as long as we know how to put the fire out. And then, of course, looking for the pathology and figuring out whether the balance, the homeostasis, the adaptive mechanisms are actually working. So saying that you think a child has neuroinflammation is fine, but you have to figure out what does that actually mean. I put this chart in because, of course, we always like to throw statistics. This was a more recent um, chart looking from 2014 to 16 in children from 3 to 17 years old ever diagnosed with selected developmental disabilities in this country. And actually, there has been a linear increase that is statistically significant in autism spectrum disorders, developmental delays, and developmental disabilities. And of course, if you look at the newspapers, all you have to do is see there's a lot of things that are going on now that just never happened before. And nobody ever asks the why questions. That's what we're going to talk about is why. So what does this mean to an autistic child? Well, something might have gone wrong at the point of conception. Even if the conception was natural or unnatural, these are questions that should be asked. That the development of the nervous system, this fragile little system is going on in the first several months of, of gestation. And if something's going on with mom, then something could be going on with fetus. 
okay? And we used to think that it was a nice little thing. They were just swimming around in amniotic fluid, just kind of drinking their own pee, because that's all they do for nine months. And it's a nice, clean, sterile place. But in fact, if things are going wrong in the maternal body, then those things actually can be transmitted to the baby through the amniotic fluid. So when you have a dysregulation due to an adverse intrauterine environment, if there's infection or toxicant exposures, environmental and food triggers has emerged as a key mechanism underlying many neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism spectrum disorders. The hallmark feature of brain disorders is neuroinflammation, which can either promote or inhibit the generation of neurons depending on what's going on in the brain and that brain pathology is suggestive of ongoing neuroinflammation or what we can call encephalitis in different parts of the brain. Another analogy that I like to use is your brain is like a giant house with a lot of rooms. There are a few fires in some of those rooms, but the entire brain is not on fire, which is why the kids can do certain things and certain things they can't do, and that's how you have to look at where are the problems and why are they occurring. We know that there's a, a relationship between brain inflammation, autism, ADHD, and even Tourette syndrome. Again, the syndrome defined as a motor tics. Oh, well, you know, your kid has tics. Have a nice day. Boys get tics. No, boys don't get tics. Girls don't get tics. People don't walk around twitching and grunting and making funny noises and stimming and all those other silly words that we used to describe as obviously a tic problem. So the question is, what makes that happen? We know that there's a similar pathology between those. In fact, and if you've attended some of the talks on PANS, and PANDAS, you know that the um, components of, uh, of the, that syndrome are the attention deficit disorders, tics, and obsessive compulsive disorders. There could be a broader range problem going on that's related to an insult in the brain or the neuronal system. It could be neurotoxicity, neuroinflammation, excitotoxicity, Sustained microglial activation, which means programmed cell death, pro-inflammatory switches called cytokines, and a lot of oxidative stress. So here's a little picture of the brain showing the prefrontal cortex, the area in the, in the middle that's kind of orangey-red. And basically, this is an area that has a lot to do with social deficits, and we see that a lot in the brains of autistic children because there's something going on there. There's gliosis, there's inflammation of the nerves. And in this particular case, ironically, they were using it as an example of what a common anti-seizure medicine called valproic acid does. I find it very ironic that a lot of the kids who do have seizures who are autistic are put on um, valproic acid, and when you understand what that does to the way the body functions, it's kind of counterintuitive to pick that of all drugs, but then I wonder sometimes why we're not on the same page as the neurologists, or why aren't they on the same page as we are. So again, think of the brain as a big, big house with a lot of rooms, and there's one of the rooms that can be on fire. Um, oxidative stress, the term that's used to influence inflammation, very familiar to all of you. The neurological symptoms are pretty much um, out there. Notice the coincidental GI problems, even the joint problems because so many of the kids are in pain or if they can verbal, they'll say, my arm hurts, my knee hurts, my leg hurts, and you get the usual go-to answers like, oh, it's growing pains. Well, all kids grow, but they don't all have growing pains. And of course, then, if you look at the multi-system effects, these are things that you see in some of your kids, and they also are all shared by other so-called autoimmune disorders. If there's a problem with the immune system, basically, take your choice, you're gonna wind up with one of those problems. So we need to find out who the free radicals are, and we need to get some superheroes in there and beat them up, and this is, the kids usually like this because they're totally into the superheroes. Some of the causes I'd like to go over now are the environmental and food allergies and toxic exposures and infections. Again, this talk could be like 12 hours and I have a little bit less than an hour to do it, so we're gonna go through a lot here. When we talk about acute inflammation, this is what we see in the immediate response to any kind of injury or infection that usually lasts a few days, um, manifested by swelling, redness, heat, and pain at the site. It's actually a good thing because what it does is it helps us fight the infection. Um, good, bad, or otherwise, another analogy is, I mean, this is like terrorism. If your body's invaded by a terrorist, you need to know who the terrorist is. But you can't just profile and say, well, I think the terrorist is gonna look like, you know, somebody who we know, if we look at the media, comes from a particular part of the country and has certain religious 
affiliations. In fact, a lot of the terrorists now that we look for are the kids who you never think are the bad guys. So don't assume that you know who the terrorists are. But once the immune system deals with the inflammation, the infection is basically killed off and the tissue heals and everybody's happy. But if you have chronic inflammation, this goes on and it doesn't stop and then there are changes in the cells and the autoimmune piece kicks in, which means the immune system really isn't sure who the bad guys are and starts creating more and more inflammation that results in tissue destruction, problems with the adaptive immune system. It can be local, but it could also be anywhere else in the body. So here's a hypothesis that was proposed that inflammatory events in pregnancy, such as response to infection, may disrupt the normal expression of immune molecules during critical stages of neural development and thereby contribute to the risk for neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism. Immune molecules such as cytokines and chemokines, if you think of them as just switches, they can be produced by the microglia in the brain and they're important for normal brain development. A single virus, or injection of a viral mimetic, which is something that actually mimics a virus, as in some of the antiviral um, medications and also sometimes the antiviral vaccines, to pregnant mice significantly and persistently impacts on the offspring's immune system. That doesn't mean something's going to happen, but it might. And studies in humans and non-human animal models have supported this hypothesis that if this ongoing disruption of the immune system occurs, inflammation becomes more persistent and it's a very important part of the autistic child. If you're genetically susceptible to things, environmental risk factors combine or synergize to create tipping threshold points for dysfunction, which is why every kid isn't the same. Everybody's got different tipping points. Everybody has different genes and different programs. And studies showing the link between the maternal immune activation and autistic-like outcomes in their children involve diverse environmental factors beyond infection, including toxin exposures, maternal stress, all of which impact inflammatory or immune pathways. And there's the reference on that. So let's talk about maternal inflammation. Infection, malnutrition, will impact on the brain's development in the child. Viral or bacterial infections have been dis uh, characterized as known disruptors of the actual shaping, the physical structure of the brain, if it occurs during that time of gestation. Fatty acid imbalances, especially polyunsaturated fatty acids, are observed in autistic patients, also patients with ADD, and even schizophrenic patients, because you know the schizophrenic people, they're just nuts. Except they're not, they're sick. And if you follow Patricia Kane's work, there's a lot to be said about fatty acid metabolism and what to possibly do about it. You've heard about omega-3s and polyunsaturated fatty acids and how strong they are to reduce inflammation in the fetal brain. So yeah, pregnant ladies should be taking um, fatty acid supplements or at least should have a good diet, but I don't know that too many obstetricians actually encourage that in their patients. Um, and then of course there was this paper on terbutaline, which is very often used to um, arrest preterm labor if it occurs. And we do that because we don't want preterm labor, but there's a consequence. And it turns out that it's been related to having seizures going forward. So if you had a pregnancy where you were put on some kind of drug to slow down labor or to stop it, there is probably a consequence that might affect your fetus, and that should be discussed with someone so they understand what the possible um, outcomes can be. So here's a little picture of a neurotoxic microglia, that red guy in the middle. On the left, where it says the letter A is blood-brain barrier, and if there's dysfunction there, basically what this is showing is that the nerve cells become overactive, metabolically things happen. A lot of the little things along the lines that you can't see are all of these inflammatory switches that get turned on, and then everything sort of gets screwed up. So we have a definite decrease in some kids with, in the white matter of the brain, and the prime microglia seem to be on alert, and they're just going to kill everybody. They're going to just mess everything up. And then, of course, if there's cerebellar dysfunction, which is the motor cortex of the brain, you can have motor issues. The thalamic hyperactivation is thought to be induced by the microglia, again, overprogramming cell death because something is going on, and it creates abnormal environment in the brain from one part of the brain to another. We talk about peroxisomes, which have enzymatic activities that are important in our physiology. Patricia Kane alluded to the peroxisomes yesterday, and I think you'll hear from her again today. 
But if we have any kind of paroxysmal function or single enzyme or transporters that are not working properly, we can have neurological problems, which can present as demyelination or loss of axonal integrity, neuroinflammation, or other neurodegenerative processes. So demyelination, another silly analogy example is, imagine if a little guy comes into your brain with a wire stripper and is basically not cutting the wires but stripping the insulation off the wires. If you did that in your house, you might turn on the light switch and the light might go on, or it might, the lamp might blow, or it might blow the entire circuit. So imagine something is going on in your kid's brain that's stripping the insulation off of the nerves. Lipopolysaccharides are another problem that we have to look for because they are indicative of potential neuroinflammation and again reactivate those microglia. We've seen that in rats. Um, even exposure as early as three days of life can lead to a robust microglia activation, both pro and anti-inflammatory. So think about what happens on the first day of life. What do we do? You know, very often we are giving a hepatitis B vaccine in 12 hours of age. Well, we don't really know what the potential of that could be, or at least we weren't told that. And just like a bad magazine subscription, if you don't opt out of it, you get it. But most mothers, when they're in labor, are not really thinking about what they're supposed to check off, I want something or I don't want something. They just want to have the baby and have the pain stop. They don't really project themselves into what's gonna happen thereafter. If we look at anti-inflammatory markers, we find that they are upregulated in the brain, and basically what you have is naturally occurring apoptosis, which is a fancy word for cell death. And then you have an increase of cell proliferation in areas where there shouldn't be cell overgrowth, and that changes the structure and function of the nervous system and the neurons. The lipopolysaccharide-exposed rats did exhibit significant impairments in communicative and cognitive functions. Well, that sounds like a lot of our kids. So maybe we should think about lipopolysaccharides. Maybe that's something that did your child in at some point. So we now know that there is a relationship between inflammation, microglial activation, and these particular influences of lipopolysaccharides. <clears throat> we have in um, the children a lot of dysfunction in T cells and B cells. These are the white blood cells or lymphocytes that run around helping the immune system find the terrorists find the infections, find the toxins, whatever, and then natural killer cells to kill them. And if everything's fine, that's happening. It's happening in your bodies right now. It Maybe it's happening as a result of what you had for dinner last night, but you're doing these things. Monocytes, things that can be detected on a regular CBC, the um, indicative of inflammation. Um, there are also alterations in immunoglobulins, so make sure that you have your serum immunoglobulins checked. Can you recognize an infection? Do you remember the infection? Are you really high on the allergy side? Is there something going on in the gut? And then there are cytokines, and all of these things can be measured in routine laboratory blood tests. You don't necessarily have to go and spend hundreds or thousands of dollars getting this done because Quest or LabCorp can do these things if you find a physician who can actually order them for you. And it's, it's not really out of order to do that. So what are the targets of neuroinflammation? Well, we have these things called toll-like receptors, which basically are supposed to turn switches on and off relative to whether there's inflammation going on in our bodies. And we know that if they're activated, it, it's associated with increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines. Too much inflammation is not a good thing. You usually need to make the fire to kill the bad guys, and then you have to put the fire out. Too much fire, not a good thing. And we know that in the autistic individuals, we have that. And now what we have is another enzyme that's particularly involved in what we call the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle, which energizes the mitochondria to generate oxygen and move the oxygen via electricity. That's what those so-called powerhouses of the cell do. They're just generators. But they have to have the right fuel and they have to do what they're supposed to do. In the presence of these lipopolysaccharides, other toxins, you have another enzyme that's directly related to reactive oxidative stress, and the NF-kappa B pathways, which basically are the pathways that actually activate inflammation in our systems, can be affected. So those things are going wrong. And then we have some other receptors that are actually involved in certain pieces of proteins that make our DNA, that respond to inflammation, brain injury, lymphocyte or white cell infiltration, and basically we've seen this, and a lot of the science going on and looking at the brains and brain function of the autistic children have been focused on what is going on, why is there so much of this activity going on in various parts of the brain. 
and other switches, um, the interleukins, IL-25, <clears throat> and so forth. And these are things that actually can be measured. Heat shock proteins have a lot to do with when we have temperatures. It's not the thing that regulates temperature, but they're proteins that tend to increase during episodes of fever and inflammation. And if you notice that the heat shock proteins, the second one, TGF-beta, another um, uh, inflammatory marker, the um, caspase, and the last one, interferon gamma, you can see a significant difference between the controls and the autistic child. What this really means to the non-scientist people in the group, basically there's something really bad going on. There's a lot of inflammation and these switches are being turned on that eventually will contribute to cell death and neuroinflammation. We have to talk about mast cells. Mast cells are actually cells that can exacerbate autoimmunity by alteration of the innate and adaptive um, pathways that we talked about. Mast cells are good guys, providing they're behaving properly and doing their job. They're involved in a lot of histamine release, type one hypersensitivity responses, autoimmune diseases like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and arthritis reactions. They're activated by the IgE, the epsilon globulin, something you can test in a regular lab test, and inflammatory mediators. These are evidence of the allergies, the atopic dermatitis. Half of the kids I see have eczema, but nobody asks, why is there so much eczema? What's triggering that? And some of these kids are little newborn babies. So when you look at a baby who's three months old and you see that their skin is all inflamed and rashy on their cheeks and they have terrible cradle cap and their skin is, just looks like sandpaper and it's red, it's not just dry skin. You gotta think about why is this happening? The inflammatory conditions again will release the various cytokines that were mentioned on the previous slide and the mast cell proteases, tryptase and histamine. And what happens is there's now an effect on the ability to fight bacterial infections, prevent parasite infections, they exacerbate atherosclerosis, promote cancer progression. This is not good. So if they're not working right, we can have a whole bunch of rotten things going on. So how do you even think about mast cell activation disorder and autism? If you have allergic symptoms and the allergist says they're not allergies, guess who's probably wrong? You see what you see, the allergist is not doing it the right thing. Intestinal inflammation, I mean, we know probably greater than 95% of children on the spectrum have something going on in their gut. Why? <clears throat> Why do they get abdominal distension and bloat and gas? Why can't they poop like normal people? What is going on in the gut? We used to call it leaky gut. People used to think, what does that mean? Like you have diarrhea? I don't know what leaky gut means, you know? But basically you're doing, talking about things on a cellular level and absorption of nutrients. If there's a breakdown, you don't absorb nutrients. You don't get nutrients. The mitochondria generators don't know what to do because they don't have enough fuel. Fevers, hives, rashes, breakdown of the blood-brain barrier you will see is brain inflammation. Neurotoxins are in the brain, reduced connectivity in the brain, brain fog. I mean, that sort of sums it up. Pain insensitivity. Most of the kids can get hurt and they never cry. <clears throat> Reduced learning, that's pretty obvious. Seizures, and of course, other symptoms. And if you can make out this slide, it actually shows on the top that if you have a baby in utero who has susceptible genes, there's maternal um, immune or allergic stuff going on, there's a premature birth that also leads to mast cell activation, and now we see what mast cells can do. You develop allergies, food intolerances, there's a lot of stress on the newborn, which creates the gut-brain dysfunction and all of the inflammation in the brain, and we wind up with autism. Why are all of these kids having problems with food? Why can't they eat normally? Why don't they poop? What's going on? And it can start in utero. So we know about microglia. We've talked about that as far as their ability to create inflammation due to mast cells. The mast cells that reside in the brain are important sources of inflammatory molecules. And the interaction between the glial cells, the neurons, result in inflammatory um, switches. And it's all due to reactive oxygen species or oxidative stress. When we have neuroinflammation, these levels are excessive and change the permeability of the blood-brain barrier, which now allows lots of other things to go wrong. So it becomes like the snowball going down the hill, and now we have a little bit of an avalanche forming. It's not just a simple problem. It's becoming more complex. It can lead to ischemia in the brain, which is lack of oxygen, traumatic brain injury, 
pain, things like multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, migraines, autism, and depression very often share a lot of the same underlying causes. Histamine is very important to understand. We all know about histamine. We know about antihistamines. We know about itching and scratching and so forth. What we probably didn't know is that histamine has a very important role in cognition, sleep, and other behaviors. It actually functions as a neurotransmitter, an immune modulator. We know that it's been implicated in autism and Tourette's. We know that it mediates inflammation in the brain. We know that it affects RNA sequencing and that those several things with all the letters are actually various histamine receptors that are in different parts of the body. So we have to recognize which ones might be triggered and what that actually means to the clinical presentation that the children will have. So this diagram is actually pretty cool. Um, in the center you have histamine and all the little letters around there are H1, H2, um, and so forth, indicating the different types of receptors. And you can have, I'm going to try to use the... So you have a lot of these clinical symptoms that are um, things that might present as far as medical issues that involve the cardiovascular system, your skin, respiratory tract, uterus, the GI tract, white blood cells, bone marrow, and of course the central nervous system. But look at all of the things on the periphery. Those are the things that happen. Your child doesn't walk in and say, gee, I think I'm having a, you know, a, an H2 reaction or something, they might just not be able to sleep, or they have headaches, or they're dizzy, or they feel like they're going to pass out, or they have actual physical signs in their blood pressure and pulse. They have heart problems. Um, they have skin flushing. They get hives. They have chron chronic congestion in the upper respiratory areas, the nose, constant rhinorrhea, sneezing, thick mucus, sinus infections, bronchospasm, asthma. Um, problems menstruating or even having a period and then having dysmenorrhea, um, terrible stomach aches, diarrhea, constipation. How can all these things be going on in the same person? Histamine could be the culprit. Check histamine levels. It's easy to do. It's a blood test. The worst part of it that people don't think about is the disturbance in the diurnal or circadian rhythm. Our biological clock is disturbed, which is why when people are supposed to get tired and sleepy at the end of the day, that's when your kid starts bouncing around and acting like a, you know, a hyperactive person and, and you can't calm them down. Whoa, antihistamines, funny thing, we used to use that 40 years ago for ADD kids. It calms them down. What I didn't know at that time was the reason why it calmed them down is because the histamine was a large part of why they might have an attention deficit problem in the first place. So instead of throwing the kid on a stimulant medication, why don't we just look at what their histamine is? Let's look and see if the allergies or whatever are a big trigger. And this is something that's been well established in the literature both five years ago and even back in 2004 when my former partner published a study where he found that at the um, increased times of pollen in the fall and in the spring, you had increased hyperactivity. And coincidentally, an increased um, amount of ADD prescriptions were being written as well. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. It's right there. We know it. So histamine, we have to look at what it does to food allergies, food poisoning, irritable bowel, inflammatory bowel, and so forth. Sleep-wake disorders and cognitive impairment have been associated with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. As far as I know, there's over 25 million children in this country alone right now on ADD drugs. That doesn't count all the ones that probably aren't being medicated or haven't been properly diagnosed. And of course, the mainstream medical community is telling us that, well, we're just over-diagnosing. We're over-labeling. And I don't think that's true. I think there's just a lot more kids with problems. When we look at the gut, we understand that the baby essentially is born with very little organisms involved. The reason that the child is supposed to pass through the vaginal canal is because that's where all the zillions of organisms are hanging out. And now we have one of the highest rates of cesarean section deliveries in the entire world. And basically, like I tell my moms, your baby came out the side door, not the front door. And if you come out that way, you don't get any of these organisms. And almost all of the kids who are delivered by cesarean section have some problem with food, digestion, or gut issues. So what happens is as you introduce more food, the organisms that you need to help digest these things are not home. They were never there. So we also should realize that we're at least 10 times more bacteria as far as DNA than we are human, which makes you realize that we're just a host for a lot of other organisms, but they're there to help us. 
If we have disturbances in the gut microbiota, which is the new term to describe the whole balance of who's living in your gut, you can have GI function problems, but you can also have central nervous problems, autonomic nervous system problems, immune system problems that can impact on your fat storage and energy balance, the blood-brain barrier function, inflammation, stress reactivity, and behaviors. It's a balance. We're, we go through this every single day of our lives, but when that balance is disturbed, then you have a problem. We know that the enteric microbiota, all those organisms, regulate that intestinal balance and that our coexistence with what's going in our gut is a dynamic and mutually beneficial relationship. It's a major determinant of health and disease. You know that a lot of people feel that the gut is actually our first brain, not our actual central nervous system, which responds to signals that come from the gut. If we fail to regulate these things, then, of course, we have a lot of inflammation again, and that can translate into things that are very common. Inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, colon cancer. Why are we telling people now that we need to have colonoscopies when we're 20, when 50 was okay? Why was a child at 14 years of age diagnosed with colon cancer a few weeks ago? What is going on with, what's go with the guts of these kids? And what are we putting in their mouths and what's happening to it? Something is very wrong, not just, well, you know, things happen. This is all we hear. All of my colleagues, well, you know, that's what happens. Oh, oh, your kid is autistic, that's what happens. That's not an answer. That's an, kind of like a what, not a why. So, studies that have been done prove this connection. Again, you can read these slides, and for the take of, sake of time, um, I don't have to you know, read them for you, but understand that if there's an imbalance in the intestinal microbes, we've got problems, and we have to figure that out. We have to understand when they are activated, does the immune system respond properly? Does it create any kind of inflammation, especially neuroinflammation? And how do we put the fires out? That's it. Um, the blood-brain barrier, again, if it's vulnerable, then a lot of things go through. Normally, we'll say, well, you know, mercury, for example, does, is an active in the body. It's in an inactive form. It doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. But when it converts in the body to the active form, it can punch little holes in the blood-brain barrier. So it's like sticking your finger in one hole in the dike to keep the water from coming out. But there's a million other holes. And that's allowing things to get into the part of the body, like the brain, where they should not be allowed to go. So we now know that the gut, the microbiota, and the immune system are implicated in the pathogenesis of what we call neuroinflammation, which translates into psychiatric and neurodegenerative diseases such as autism. Short-chain fatty acids, again, I think we can go through that rather quickly because it's been discussed by other people, and um, basically we understand how important they are for regulating gut function, um, how to deal with it as far as dietary supplementation, that they need to be there to ferment all the carbohydrates because carbohydrates are good. Unfortunately, the carbohydrates that we're giving our kids are not good, they're not digestible, we don't know what to do with them, and they create inflammation. Um, checking things like propionic acid, looking at the carnitine profiles will tell us how the fats are being used, and then we have to look very often in the stool to see are there a lot of short-chain fatty acids? What are they telling us about other organisms that you've been hear, hearing for the last few days thrown around about clostridia and all these other types of things? Like, what are they doing there? And what signals are they sending to the brain? And do we need to kill them? Um, and we uh, also talk about the effects of short-chain fatty acids on the actual citric acid cycle, which again is how the mitochondria and every cell generate oxygen. So we think that autism spectrum disorders are actually produced by pre- and or postnatal alterations in the intestinal microbiota in a sensitive subpopulation. The old uh, adage of, well, everybody's fine. Clearly there are subpopulations which are not fine, and they're the, ones up, they're the kids that wind up being sick. And that's true of adults, too. I mean, if you have friends that are getting sick and being diagnosed with things, it's not because they're bad people. It's just because something's up with their program that's allowed this to happen. Um, some more about fatty acids. Again, a lot of this um, Dr. Kane talks about, but we talk about omega-3 fatty acids. The balance is important. Every fish oil supplement isn't the same. Every fish oil supplement isn't necessary to give every child. You got to figure it out find out where the deficiencies are because then you know that you might actually get somewhere because they are anti-inflammatory. 
Um, I kind of like this quote that comes back from the you know, 14th and 15th century. All substances are poisons. There is none which is not a poison, but the right dose is what differentiates a poison from a remedy. You know, there's a lot of things that we do that are thought to be bad, but in the right application, they actually do something positive. So we have to talk about toxic and exposure. It's very sad that we're polluting the entire planet. I can't do anything about that. I stopped using certain things to kill weeds, and I decided I'll pull dandelions instead of squirting them with stuff so that my kids and my dog don't run all over them and bring it into the house and so forth. But it is what it is. And if you watch TV, like this morning I was watching the news, and just about every commercial is about a weed killer. Um, we know that there are many, many studies that support heavy metal exposure, especially mercury, is a possible underlying cause of autism, that these, particular, these children are very susceptible to this, that air pollution is a big deal, that prenatal exposure while mom is pregnant. Where was mom working? What did she do? Did she travel in a car? Was she flying in a plane? Was she working in a hospital? Was she an x-ray technician? Was she sick? Did she take medications? Anything is the beginning of where your history should start when it comes to the autistic child. Because we know that this can contribute to behavioral problems and developmental disabilities. Um, we know that the traffic and exposure to lots of air pollution, not only are there, is there more incidence of cancer, but there's more incidence of autoimmune disorders and autism in those places as well. And that it has a lot to do with the patient's gene environment interaction. So if they have everything working right and all those little inflammatory switches go on and all the microglia do their thing, you're okay. Otherwise you get sick and something happens. The organophosphate insecticides, for example, chlorpyrifos are widely used. We know this and we know there's a direct correlation and I believe that um, Stephanie Seneff is gonna talk about that a little bit later today, which is fascinating information. Um, oxidative stress can affect uh, the immune responses when exposed to these organophosphates. And of course, if this happens during the pregnancy, it certainly can enforce the possibility that there might be some long-lasting alterations that are relevant to autism. Lead has been identified as one of the main neurotoxicants. Um, when I was doing general pediatrics, many, I guess we started screening in New York State. Um, if it was less than 15 micrograms in the blood, it was okay. Then they dropped it to 12, then 10, then 9. Then it was like less than 5 is okay. And now actually on some pages and what day of the week, the CDC will say, well, you know, actually no lead is a good thing to have. And we know that a lot of our children are lead poisoned. The trouble is when you look in the blood, you don't or rarely find a kid with elevated lead levels. Because in order to understand what happens to that lead, you have to have a functioning cellular system of detoxification. And if you don't have that, then you have literally three or four days to get rid of those substances. Otherwise, the lead, mercury, or other metals kind of get stored up in the body. And they're what we call lipophilic, which means they're attracted to fat cells. And a growing child has the most fat cells in two organ systems primarily, the brain and in their bone. And it has been studied and proven that when we think that there's lead in the children's body, that there have been tests shown that there's a lot of lead being radiated from the growing bones. And of course, we know that lead in the brain can absolutely cause neurological problems. And um, we know that uh, there are studies, this particular one that was published in 16, which is fairly recent, looking at 60 kids on the spectrum compared to the healthy controlled children, that the blood lead levels were significantly higher in the autistic group compared to the healthy children. And there was a significant correlation based on the CARS test and IQ. And frankly, if you picked up my old Nelson's textbook of pediatrics that's collecting dust on a shelf in my office and, and probably is a, I don't know, it's probably an addition that's easily 20 years old, look up lead poisoning and you describe what we now call autism. And it's right there. So lead poisoning. Mercury, we don't like mercury. We used to play with mercury. We used to break thermometers and play like little hockey with the little globs of silver. It was all very cute. We had a great time. We had no idea that that was a problem because it was inert. It wasn't doing anything. But now we know that mercury and other forms can disrupt the glutamatergic homeostasis, glutamate being an excitatory neurotransmitter that we overproduce. It's an amino acid. We all have it. And it interestingly responds to distress in the gut. So if glutamate goes up, and there's something wrong with your GABA receptors, which pushes it down as an inhibitory neurotransmitter. You have a kid who just doesn't sit still, is jumping around, is aggressive, or is even having seizures. 
We know about impairment of methylation. You probably heard all about methylation several times. Um, using um, insulin-like growth factor, which you can measure, methionine synthase, another enzyme that might be not functioning well, which will affect cerebral and cerebellar blood flow. And then, of course, we can measure those inflammatory cytokines. They will all start to become abnormally high, which leads to degeneration in the nervous system, long-range axon degeneration, overgrowth of dendrites or abnormal nerves, neuroinflammation, the microglia, which are now experts in, um, on, um, brain immune response and oxidative stress, lipid peroxidation we talked about, decreased reduced glutathione and elevation of oxidized glutathione. Do we have enough garbage trucks in our body to get rid of all this stuff? What's the point if you have full garbage trucks? They're going to pass right by your house. They're not going to pick up any garbage. Okay, those are the garbage trucks that are oxidized. We need reduced garbage trucks. We need glutathione that can pick up all of these things, assuming the immune system can do that, and get rid of it, because you only have 96 hours to do it after you're exposed. A neurotoxicant that's potentially one of the triggers for autism as it introduces neuroinflammation and release of neuropeptides. And then this other um, study that was reported in 2016 measuring a substance called neurokinin A in blood mercury and found that there's a direct correlation between this inflammatory trigger and the effect on CARS testing and that 78% of the autistic kids had elevated mercury levels and 55% an increase in serum neurokinin. So this is actual science. This is not like, oh, well, we're just blaming it on mercury. There is science behind this. What about the preservatives, the parabens? It's in food, it's in drugs, it's in cosmetics. You know, when you kiss your kid and you have lipstick on, you're lead poisoning them because there's lead in your lipstick. That's what makes it look so colorful. Um, if it's got, if cosmetics and other chemicals have these um, parabens in them, that makes them even more toxic. And they also can affect estrogenic activity, which is quite interesting because many of the girls that I see have not attained their menstrual cycle, they have not um, menstruated regularly, or they did it when they were six. And they go to the pediatric endocrinologist and they say, oh, well, that happens sometimes. I'm sorry, six-year-old girls are not menstruating because that happens sometimes. There's something very wrong and it can be a result of hazardous chemical exposure. They can affect learning disability, they lead to increased oxidative stress, reduced glutathione decreases, so no garbage trucks, lots of full garbage trucks, but no empty garbage trucks, and then the snowball starts rolling. You've got mitochondrial dysfunction, you've got neuroinflammation, you've got pro-inflammatory switches in the brain, and, you, and it disturbs the actual carriers of energy to the cells, which is AMP and ATP. So if you sum it up and you look at the environmental insults, it can affect the peripheral and central nervous system, the immune system, which can lead to neurological problems, immunological problems, neuroimmunological problems, abnormal autonomic regulation, so you have the kid getting up when they should be going down, they're hyper, they're sweating, they're red in the face, their pulse is rapid, they're like running a marathon even though they're sitting still. We have problems in the gut, we can have problems with the immune system overall. We have allergies. We have neurochemical pathology and even neuroanatomical pathology. Probably not a bad idea to get an MRI. If, you, if your car is overheating or the lights on your dashboard says check engine, you're going to run to the gas station or the dealer and somebody's going to put that car up and look under the hood and look at the engine. We, we never look at the engine here. I mean, why don't we look at the brain and see what's going on, at least structurally? because there might be things that are obviously wrong there that will tip you off as to what the toxic problem is, or maybe there is just structural inflammation that can be treated in other ways. And finally, the uh, old electromagnetic deal. I mean, when I first went into practice, we used to ask people, do you live anywhere near where there are overhead wires? because we knew that electromagnetic radiation was not good. And now we're sitting in a room and we're all being irradiated. I'm standing in front of a computer that's poisoning me, there's Wi-Fi every place, and, and how do you get out of it? Well, you can go to the booth where they set up a clean room where it limits all of that stuff. Or you can do what some people in environmental medicine have done. They've taken over motels and just stripped them down and recreated them with non-toxic floor covering and wall covering, and people go there and actually after three days, they don't feel sick anymore. But that's not our world. That's not what we live in. So Wi-Fi, 
Um, don't let the kids sit with iPads or go to bed with these things. One of my patients, the father works nights, and he used to see the blue-white glow coming from under the door of his son, who was very ADD, and basically wasn't sure that it meant anything, and he came home the next morning, and he's coming in, and his son's going off to school, and he's in his boxers, and he's got no school books, and he says, where are you going? I said, I'm going to school. I said, what do you mean you're going to school? You don't even have your clothes on. You haven't done your homework. What's, what's happening? And basically, the kid looked at him like he was nuts. And that night, he said, no more iPad before bed. And the next day, he knew that the child slept better and seemed to be a lot more organized. You know, when the kid comes to my office, they're usually on somebody's phone or playing with a tablet or something. It's great for babysitting, but it's probably one of the worst things that we've ever done. I didn't grow up with it, a lot of you guys didn't grow up with it, but this is all our kids know, our grandchildren, it's all they know. They look at you like you're crazy when you tell them that they can't have their phone. If your phones are in your pockets right now, I suggest you take them out if you value your testicles. Or if you're women, don't stick them in your sports bra straps. Or don't stick it in your breast pocket here. My phone's in my bag on the floor. I keep it as far away from me as possible because I actually experienced numbness and tingling in my quads when I had it in my left pocket and I thought it was nuts. So I switched sides and the same thing happened on my right side. My muscles were actually doing something just because I had that electronic receiver, okay, it's picking up signals and it's sending out signals and it's not meant to be on us or near us. So when people say get this stuff away from your body, it's real. And try to do this as little as possible, including yourselves. Don't go to bed with an iPad in your face. It's not good for your brain. We know that the clinical manifestations of exposure can change the brain function, autonomic nervous system, and electrophysiologic function. Sensory processing disorders can be triggered by Wi-Fi. Seizures can be triggered by Wi-Fi. Sleep disturbances. And then we get the chemical stuff that you don't see. Deficiencies in glutathione, peroxidized cell membrane lipids, which means now the cells are vulnerable to damage by toxins. Mitochondrial dysfunction, which means you're not generating enough oxygen for your cells to do their job. Immune system disturbances, which is the whole purpose of this conversation, and increased oxidative stress that leads to free radical damage that compromise the blood-brain barrier, and then basically all bets are off. Once the snowball starts rolling down the hill, it can become an avalanche. You have to figure out why these things are happening to your kids. If they're your kids, if you're practitioners and you're seeing kids, Ask the why questions. Be a good detective. I always use the, uh, the analogy of the game Clue. You know, there's the kid lying on the floor of the dining room with the candlestick next to his head. So you come in and you're the detective and say, look, he was hitting the head with the candlestick. We know what's wrong with him. But then you see over in the corner of the room there's an empty bottle of, of something that has a skull and crossbones on it. And then you roll him over and you see there's a knife sticking out of his head, back and he's got a gunshot wound in his head and he's got a, a red ring around his neck and he's got track marks on his arms. So clearly he wasn't just hitting the head with a candlestick. Be good detectives. If your parents ask these questions, find a physician who's gonna help you understand what that might mean to you as an individual. We don't want to practice the one-size-fits-all medicine either as doctors who treat children who are frankly ill, they have multiple medical problems, and very often they recover because we take the time to figure out not only what happened to them, but why did it happen to them and not the kid next door, okay? And it's very complicated. There are answers. This is how children recover. When we figure out what's wrong with them, we can fix it. Sometimes it's harder than others, and I think that we're all on the same learning curve. When I left pay, um, my med regular um, peds practice 15 years ago to do this, I'm still learning. I still come to the conferences now. I can help you guys understand something, but I also sit in the audience where you are and listen to other really, really smart people present the science. And when you go home and you present this information to your own pediatrician, they go, ah, you know, that's a lot of you know what. No, doctor, I'm sorry, you need to read. You need to keep up with stuff. You can't tell me stuff that's, that you learned 40 years ago. It doesn't apply anymore. So let's stay on the learning curve. Let's be smart. Let's be good detectives and ask the right questions. And if you don't find somebody who's going to help you answer those questions, then keep looking, okay? So thanks for your attention. Thanks for waking up. And um, I guess we can have some questions. It should be on. Is this on? Okay. It's on. Um, so if you use your cell phone for your alarm and you put it on Bluetooth, you know, you turn it on, or airplane mode, is that what it is? Airplane mode? 
does it still emit? Supposedly it's not picking up or sending signals. Okay, so then you can still use it as an alarm away I from think, your yeah, head. But I wouldn't put it, like I see my kids, they yeah. have it that's on their night tables. Right. Like I have a clock radio. Oh, Dad, what do you have a clock radio for? That's so old fashioned. Right. Yeah, but it's not irradiating me. Right. Think about newborn babies. You got the baby monitor, you got the voice monitor, you got the video cameras. Right. And then you see the electromagnetic rays going around right. the baby's crib. So just put it away and then put it yeah, on airplane and mode. Theoretically, shut off. Um, you know, Wi-Fi. I mean, there's a lot of things. You know, plug into the cable. Oh yeah, we're all, we're all going to do that. We're okay. not going to do it. But understand this consequences. So, so as far as away from your face, the better off you are. So my other question is, you know, these children that are having vaccine injury and unfortunately leave this world, they do all these tests and they come back and say, we have no idea what happened. And, and obviously the science is out there. What is it that the regular medical doctors are testing for that they're, or they're not testing for when those kids um, no longer are with us? Um, well, being one of those doctors, um, basically they're not testing for anything because they don't know what they're looking for. Doing a CBC can give you some ideas. Maybe you'll see allergy cells, maybe you'll see high levels of macrophages and you know there's inflammation, but then they don't know. Um, the ones that are good are the ones that say, I don't know what to do with this. The ones that I think are a problem are the ones who pretend to know or dismiss it. There's got to be a reason. So they're not really doing any of the things. I, I have a, a lab requisition list that's one full page typewritten with about eight or, seven or nine tests on one line. So it looks like 40 or 50 tests going on. And other doctors look at this and say, I'm not going to sign off on that. I'm not going to do that. That's crazy. Well, it's not crazy. It's all pieces of the puzzle. So you have to look at the immune system markers, which you can do. You look at neurotransmitters. You look at markers for antibodies to your infections. You can find out a whole bunch of stuff from blood and urine. And then you can go further if you have to do other things and do stool tests and so forth. Okay? Okay, thank you. So you just have to know what to, um, you know, what to test for. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? No questions? Oh, hi. Thank you very much, Dr. Ellis. Um, I just wanted to add that uh, in the past couple of years, I've been doing genomic studies. I use a company called Genomind, and Genomind gave us a panel that's primarily oriented toward psychotropic medications, but has a wide variety of neurotransmitters and receptors that are assessed genomically. And they have a new product called Mindful DNA, which is geared toward complementary and alternative uh, strategies. I think that would be very helpful. It's a cheek swab, doesn't require any blood drawing, very simple, about $300. Thank you. Um, true story, there are many tests like that. A lot of the psychiatrists are using this now because they want to figure out what medicines are appropriate for an individual patient and how they metabolize it. What they're really looking at is the cytochrome enzymes, which are the enzymes of which we have hundreds that actually tell us how we're going to be able to break down and utilize certain drugs. But it is helpful because there are definitely kids who are on drugs that they should never, ever take. It also looks at a lot of other things. If you know what you're looking at, it tells you a lot of information about vulnerabilities. It's always a good idea. And um, Dr. Burkhardt, right? Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, it costs a few hundred dollars, may be covered by insurance. But again, doing that and even going further and doing whole exome sequencing are things that we do when, at least for me, when I can't figure out what's going on with the kid. And there's obviously more problems than present in the, in, you know, on the surface or at least on the surface that I'm working at. So genetics are a part of it. Epigenetics, bigger part of it. So that's something you can put on your list of things to think about. Question on the testing. Um, if a child uh, is on supplements, has been on the gluten-free diet, is doing a lot of things that the parent thinks is perfect, but they know there's more there, are the tests that you're talking about going to be accurate, or do you need to, cl to take all of this away from the child before they can, you can get a legitimate test? I personally never tell anybody to stop what they're doing because when I'm coming in and testing, it'll give me an idea of how well what they're doing is actually working. So if you're on a gluten-free diet and you still see there's antibodies to gluten or gliadin proteins, like screening a kid for celiac, that's significant. If they're not there, but we know that there are food issues in the past, then they may be negative because of the virtue of the fact that you remove that from the diet. Same thing with a lot of this. I like to see how well is what you're doing working, because a lot of people come to me and they've been doing lots of things on their own or from other doctors or whatever, and 
if it's working for your kid, the last thing you want to do is have somebody tell you, now you need to stop this for a week. You probably don't want to do that because the consequences will be regression. So if you know that you're doing your lab work in the context of what the child is on, then you know how to interpret those labs. But it's not really 